Welcome to day one of the Nuffield Virtual National Conference. Um, my name's Emma Durano. I'm a 2014 Nuffield Scholar from Victoria, and I'm also the Victorian Farmers Federation President. Firstly, I'd like to start the day by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. I'm at the, uh, from Gurnai, Kurnai country, um, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present and emerging. Uh, I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today in the conference. Um, just a big thanks to our partners. Our two virtual national conference partners are Rabobank and CSIRO. Thank you very much for your support. Today's conference is generously and exclusively supported by Rabobank, uh, long-time supporters of Nuffield. Um, I also welcome, and this is super cool actually, uh, Jess G is a, a Melbourne artist and illustrator from Think in Colour. Um, Jess's mission today is to record the discussion by graphic design. Um, you can actually pin her video to watch those little cartoons unfold. And um, it's a bit like, hey, hey, it's Saturday. She'll draw some cartoons of me with a big nose or something to keep us entertained. Um, she's going to communicate the information from the, the speakers in artistic ways. Um, and she'll be on screen creating those during the event. Um, you can get those graphics actually after the conference if you would like, uh, just make a request. So we've got an exciting lineup of speakers and we are encouraging all of your curious questions. Please direct them into the QA or the chat box and where possible speakers uh, will respond directly and we'll attempt to get through as many of those questions as we can during the panel um, presentation. Uh, the program's tight as always with Nuffield. So let's welcome our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Gabriella Burian, and she's a global partnership and multi-stakeholder platform lead at Bayer. Uh, she's responsible for overseeing the company's global sustainable agricultural strategies. For over 20 years, she's worked to build meaningful cross-cultural relationships and deliver env environmental strategy, diversity and collaboration. Guided by the vision Health for All, Hunger for None, Bayer has established clear targets to be met by 2030 around food security, healthcare and ecological footprint reduction, while also becoming one of the first industrial companies in the world to integrate sustainability targets into management compensation. Gabriella will focus on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are the theme for the conference actually. Um, and Gabby has been leading Bayer's engagement with the United Nations Food System Summit for over the past 18 months. So. Gabby's going to actually walk us through a little bit more of sustainable development goals. Uh, we often wonder what, how, how do we define sustainability and thankfully it's actually been done for us. So thank you very much, Gabriella, and welcome. A big pleasure to be here. I'm Brazilian and I don't know if you know, but uh, we Brazilian, we dream about Australia. Australia is for us almost a Brazil, a little bit better than very special to be with Nutfield in Australia today, not living, not producing CO2 emission, not using the flag, then very, very happy. Uh, yes, and the, starting this journey some years ago, back in 2015, in fact, with United Nations, defined a way for the society to have some goals. And what's interesting is for both Newfield and for Bayer, those goals are very similar to our goals, are very similar to what we all want to deliver. And in fact, to what each one that's here tonight or today, uh, each day working to deliver. For Bayer is health for all, hunger for known. For the sustainable development goals is everything that goes from hunger, zero hunger, poverty, no poverty, until what we can see, that's the theme of today's session, responsible consumption and production. Then for agriculture, the sustainable development goals was an awesome gift. And now some gift because finally people could understand a little bit better the role that we all play each day and sometimes each night during the entire year in the entire crop with innovation, with new solutions, trying to figure it out a way that we can help to produce food enough for all 
preserving the environment at the same time, reducing the amount of insulin, and also helping climate change, helping to avoid climate change. This is us. It's only agriculture that can help deliver all the 17 sustainable development goals. There is no other industry. There is no other people that are like us working night and day to ensure people can be fed and the climate, can, the climate change can be reduced. What's important in this environment, knowing that, yes, we all know, we are part of the solution, we have innovation, we have always working to deliver more in taking care of the environment, and now we are working to reduce CO2 emission. Then what we want, we want society to better understand. We want society to understand that there is not only one solution, one magic solution that will solve everything. The solution comes from the land, the solution comes from innovation, the solutions come from different sides of farmers across the world, from diverse perspectives, from food that is necessary, from different cultural aspects. In Brazil, for instance, it's absurd if someone tried to talk about the no meat today or something like that. It's really something that we cannot even listen to something like that. In Africa, this is something that shouldn't be even mentioned because they still need a lot. And what's necessary now is for people from the cities to understand we are here, we are working to ensure we deliver sustainable development goals, but there is a lot that needs to be understood. Farmers are central to this discussion, central. Climate is, um, we are bringing a solution for climate change, but farmers need to be compensated for this. Then what's now for us? We need to ensure we connect. We need to engage, it's crucial. We know we have seen in the sustainable food system discussion in the now conference of climate, conference of biodiversity, there is a lot going on. And if we can take a moment to engage and tell our story and explain, many times they just don't know, then if we explain how we are doing and how global trade is crucial, to ensure food security, how innovation can help the transformation, and how farmers need to be at the center of everything that we are discussing. Then we can have a, a full group with us, helping us to advance and helping us to deliver. Then next week, in two weeks, there will be the Conference of Climate. It's an awesome opportunity for each one here to use your be the best media that you want, if it doesn't matter which social media you use. If it's not social media, no problem. Discuss with your neighbor, with your family. Try to bring what are the questions, what needs to be better understood. And let's together make sure our society understands the role that we are playing to help deliver sustainable development goals together. Then thank you and a happy conference to all and a happy agriculture to all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Gabriella. And um, uh, really key points there around engagement being crucial. And I think that that's been really, like I was really fascinated watching the um, cartoon come to life. Um, but really, we must connect, engage and tell our story. And I think that, that was a great point. And we're just all remembering that the, the focus of this session is actually on responsible consumption and production. So there's no question that we have that role to play in regards to helping people make better consumption choices. Uh, next in the lineup is Lachlan Monsborough, who leads sustainability in Rabobank's rural division, which services farmers across the Americas and Australia and New Zealand. After completing agribusiness studies at Orange Ag, 
Lachlan developed a career working in tropical plantations and commodities across the equatorial belt, leading to senior international roles in Barry Calibo and Ecom. He returned to Australia at the beginning of 2018 to join Rabobank. So Lachlan, welcome. Oh, thanks very much. And um, it's, um, it feels a uh, sort of, um, I'm severely underqualified to uh, speak to a group of um, Nuffield scholars. So I hope you all uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm going to talk to um, what, what farmers have to consider over the, over what I would say the next 30 years in regard to SDG 12, right? About responsible consumption and production. The first slide I'd like to present on this is that we've got a journey over the next 30 years um, under the banner of responsible consumption and production to reduce probably first and foremost our carbon footprint, but make sure these other things I've got in the bottom line here, animal welfare, water, biodiversity and soil health, are taken care of as well. And I've created this little infographic, which sort of says, if you're a producer looking at this now, this is the timeline you, you may have to be on um, across the next 30 years in terms of what you're going to have to on, do on farm to improve, improve these metrics or improve these themes, if you like, um, to, to, to meet certain markets. Now, I haven't just dreamed up these five um, these five themes, uh, and I just want to go to the next slide, please, and show people um, where where we've come up with so what and how we've come up with that. So if you jump on any of these websites of these brands um, on the next slide, you'll see all of these multinational, fast-moving consumer goods companies have got these. I put a box around Coles and Woolies. Um, just because they're not multinationals, unless you include New Zealand. Um, the, um, and, and, but just to give you an, if, you, if you're not convinced by sort of what I'm telling you, um, jump, on, jump on these websites and you'll see, what, you'll see what these companies are up to in that regard. And all of them have those central themes. So I think the next slide is, is me sort of grapple with from not only the bank point of view, but also a, a farmer point of view, the, um, the market wants this, but how do you actually measure it? What's the baseline you're working off? What, what, are, the, what are the different things? And I thought I'd use the example of carbon because it is, it is the hot topic at the moment within this sort of, let's say the Australian agricultural community. I mean, What's going to happen in a couple of weeks? Is ScoMo going to Glasgow or not? And what are the implications for farmers long-term? Does it just turbocharge the carbon market even further if he does? Um, if he doesn't, what does it mean? There's all these sort of questions going around people's heads. Um, so what I'd like to focus on here, and the next slide, please, um, is everybody's talking about carbon price at the moment and it's you, you can't you, can, you can't get away from it every and so I just chucked up a couple of price graphs and it's very obvious to see why right so I've got the Australian carbon credit unit price history here and I've got the EU graph here now you can't go and enter the European market because they have to be um, credits derived in the EU but they're very similar in terms of their shape in terms of the price history. But what I think there is a, in terms of this sort of responsible production, what I think I'm worried about from an agricultural point of view at the moment is nobody is actually talking about in agriculture is, or very small sections are talking about, I should say, is what is the actual cost of carbon production? Um, in terms of what does it take a farmer to originate one tonne of carbon or carbon dioxide equivalent, whatever you want to call it. And so just to sort of round out this presentation and to, to discuss this, I've tried to create a couple of graphs about what people should be considering in this space. So I think the thing that's really important on this 30 year horizon is to think about Firstly, and, and this is sort of a bit livestock focused because that's where 80% of our footprint is in agriculture in terms of our methane. 
over the next 30 years, there's going to be various abatement opportunities for reducing our methane. That could be in feed additives, that could be in pasture change or further additives, um, whether it be tannins, whether it be oils, um, then there's going to be the capture of methane. And we're going to get to a much lower total figure, but also an intensity figure over the next 30 years. However, at various times over the next 30 years, different markets are going to require the farmer to produce zero uh, carbon zero or carbon neutral raw products. Right now, when that kicks in, it'll be different for every single market. So if we go, if we jump back to slide two, all these different companies have got different requirements of or what different promises, if you like, of when they're going to be carbon neutral. So if, if we think about it, they're not just going to be able to flick a switch at 2040 in the case of JBS and say, hey, today we want to be carbon neutral. There's going to have to be incremental um, in the supply chain, a combination between offsets and abatements that you're going to think about. Now, you having an understanding of that as a producer is really, really critical to working out actually when you will have to actually start to factor carbon in as a cost to your production and when there are opportunities for you to sell your excess carbon in the market. So as you can see, you've got a cost and volume of carbon produced. Every farm's going to be different. It depends on what your vegetation is, your age of vegetation, what baseline you're coming off in terms of soil and soil organic matter. And there's probably going to be an opportunity over the next 10 years before the market actually requires carbon neutral raw products to be able to sell to that market if you can certify and verify it and if the cost of doing so makes sense, right? But at some point over the next 20 years, where you're selling your commodities are going to require information. So maybe your cost of production or your volume of production of carbon isn't going to be able to be able to offset, in this case, whatever your methane abatement is. So getting an understanding and in terms of when the technologies are going to come in, which allows you to reduce your own emission versus when the market is actually going to require you to offset is absolutely critical about what, when you decide to enter the carbon market or if you decide to enter the carbon market to essentially monetize the carbon you're sequestering either through vegetation or soil. Um, I, think, I think one of the one of the key things before I close is to is to just to say if you're not thinking about both sides of the coin, is you, you could be lending yourself to an unforeseen exposure down the track. If suddenly the market players all act as one, right, and say we need we need this product to be carbon neutral and you haven't done anything in terms of either banking your offsets, banking your credits, and or you haven't actually acted on your abatement curve, your, what you might have to pay to enter into the market might be very great. So I think what I'm trying to get across here in terms of responsible consumption, uh, responsible productivity and in line with the SDG 12 is that we need to consider both sides of the coin when entering these markets. So the same can be said for all of the themes. I think carbon is the most, probably carbon and water are the most developed, although they were not being asked, there's no sort of, uh, let's say, water neutral targets in the world or anything like that, but certainly on biodiversity, uh, soil health, um, there could be similar things like that that we have to consider in being responsible agricultural um, responsible agricultural producers in the future, which may go the same journey as carbon. So I wish um, everybody um, a really good conference and um, 
I look forward to, well, hopefully in 2022, meeting some of you and um, having this conversation in further detail. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Lachlan. We're actually going to go to our panel session now. Uh, we still have Gabriella here with us and Lachlan is part of the panel also. And I just firstly would like to make a late apology for Kerry ann Lamb, um, a scholar who has been unable to uh, make it today. But I will pass over to these scholars who will introduce themselves briefly, their study, study topics and some of the outcomes um, as part of the theme, you know, tying it all back into our sustainable development goal theme of responsible consumption and production. And I will start with Jake Newnham. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Jake Newnham and I'm from Lodina Orchard in Tasmania. Uh, we're a family owned commercial fruit orchard growing cherries and apricots. Uh, for my Nuffield, I travelled to Chile, New Zealand, Canada and America, uh, looking at improving sweet cherry fruit quality, predominantly post-harvest through packaging, cold chain management <coughs> and harvesting and packing procedures. Some of the key recommendations of that study were that the global marketplace we exist in is getting more competitive and we do need to maintain a high quality of fruit and to encourage modification of current box designs to allow for forced air cooling. This gives us the best chance of getting a, a better product. Um, since my study has been completed, we have changed our box design at our farm. So we're the first cherry growers in Tasmania to have a vented box. Uh, we were the first last year to force their cool our fruit. So it's only one year. I don't have a lot of data, but anecdotally, we had some really good feedback. Uh, we were able to raise the room temperature we pack in from 10 to 15 degrees, which definitely benefited the comfortability of the workers, a few less sniffles. And we we're able to dispatch fruit at a core temperature of one to two degrees, whereas previously we were running at four to five. So everything's positive so far. Awesome, Jake. And less sniffles in uh, this time and place is a good thing for everybody. Um, thanks, Jake. Uh, to Tom Green, give us your little spiel about what you learned on your Nuffield. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Yeah, my name's Thomas Green, 2019 Nuffield Scholar, uh, who was sponsored by Rabobank. Uh, so I currently work as general manager at Thomas Foods International Feedlot in South Australia. Uh, we're an intensive uh, beef producing business and a farming business. So we, we currently have a 17,000 head feedlot expanding to 30,000 and a 15,000 hectare cattle breeding and irrigation property. Uh, we're a large uh, employer in the area and, and in the next couple of years we'll have upward of 50 staff. Uh, my study topic was animal welfare, so it was good to hear it mentioned previously by Lachlan, and it really, I honed in on, on intensive animal production. I made a conscious effort to try and visit a, a sort of a vast uh, varying producers, so that's from subsistence farmers in Kenya right through to 100,000 head feedlots in uh, the panhandle of Texas, so it gave me a really good broad understanding. A couple of really quick key learnings. Um, I found it a really challenging topic and still do. And I, I think it's boiled down to me because animal welfare is extremely emotive and it's subjective and it really does mean something different to everyone. Uh, and I did find traveling that, that all producers globally, it doesn't matter where they are, really did respect and want the best for their animals. But there was a key, there was a few key factors that, that drove, drove the, the level of animal welfare standards. And some of them uh, are government legislation, wealth, uh, demographics and cultural religion, just to name a few. Uh, one more quick key learning, uh, a bit close to home, it doesn't matter where you are in the supply chain, whether it be a producer, retailer, consumer, it's really important to educate yourself uh, and get to know your supply chain stakeholders. And I think by doing that, you can start to develop and share, share values and build trust. Uh, since completing the, the report phase, and I think Nuffield's ongoing forever, I think you you're buried with it. So, but, but uh, thus far I've brought back and, and continue to emphasize animal welfare in, in our wider business. And just reflecting on, on this session's responsible production SDG, I think it ties in really nice with what we're trying to do, but in general, sustainable uh, meat protein production globally ties into to almost all the SDGs and including some of the real headliners like uh, poverty, hunger and, and good health and action. Thanks, Emma. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Um, you're damn right about it being a really emotional issue. And I think that it's like particularly in regards to our, um, our 
responsible consumption and production. That's that's key to that whole conversation, I think. Uh, next up is Alistair Core. Uh, go for your life, Alistair. Thanks, Emma. Uh, yeah, as, uh, as you said, my name's Alistair Core. I'm from Queensland and I manage some uh, property aggregations uh, with uh, beef cattle using regenerative grazing techniques. I also, with my wife and I also run a beef cattle trading enterprise in the area as well. Uh, my topic was the collateral benefits of cattle welfare during handling and transport. And, and my topic wasn't intended to diverge away from the fundamental requirement that we do need to identify a cattle as sentient beings and, and not just a commodity. But I guess what I wanted to find was not just how to improve animal welfare, but um, how to provide the knowledge, skills, and, and I guess the tools to produce so that animal welfare is an inevitable consequence. Um, my report was targeted at producers as I believe really they have the biggest influence, probably arguably, arguably the greatest responsibility, but they're also, it's ultimately, they're the biggest beneficiary of a successful and sustainable industry. So um, the recommendations that came from my report was a few, but probably the most significant was that was to replicate a, a US beef industry initiative in Australia here, which was the cattle handling and transport symposium, uh, which, which could in fact present information and scientific papers or collaborate, collaborate and identify current and future areas of focus and research, but it was ultimately to disseminate that information. Um, as the dust settled on my report, I, I did consult the industry body to uh, just to, to discuss with the suitability. Unfortunately, that was in the grips of the pandemic as we're still experiencing, and I'm not sure as we can all appreciate that conferences have had some challenges to organise in the current climate. Um, however, it hasn't been shelved, it's just uh, on hold for the time being. But uh, since completing my scholarship, um, I've joined an industry body to contribute towards research, development, and adoption recommendations, um, and also with the industry policy working group, um, and at more of a production level, it's also uh, invested in a paddock remote weighing platform, uh, which is almost instantly assesses animal performance um, and on you know and, and its influence on animal welfare. Um, yeah, and relating to the sustainable consumption and production, I think personally. My topic was more in line with the target of probably 12.2, which was to achieve the sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources, probably where I honed in on. Thanks, Emma. Awesome. Thank you. And finally, uh, Tamara Ubergang, um, talk to us about farming fashion. This one's a, a bit of a left fielder. It also was a surprise to me that I ended up getting so involved and interested in um, the fashion supply chain. Um, my name is Tamara Ubergang. I'm a food and fibre producer. And until, um, until this Nuffield um, journey, I'd really considered myself a, a bulk commodity producer, having, um, you know, growing a raw product and sending something that I knew was destined for China um, or a, um, a spinning mill somewhere to be blended with other products. Um, and it was yeah such a long way between the cotton field and a pair of jeans or a t-shirt. Um, so uh, for me, I had considered that um, being sustainable was something of a baseline for farmers, but um, researching fashion, it really seemed that sustainable was a, um, a premium option or a luxury um, and not a passing fad which, um, and uh, yeah, and more of a passing, a passing fad. And it was that fundamental mentality um, that really highlighted the differences between um, farming and Australian cotton and the, um, the global fashion industry, which is one of the, which is the fourth largest contributor to global greenhouse gases um, and contributes massively to textile waste, um, which really leads into, um, the, the issue um, of aligning with um, the 12th SDG. Um, but really, it would be simple to say that we need to cease production because the power of consumerism is a great way to, to align with our goals. Um, if we could uh, tap into that market of a person that really wants to buy a carbon neutral T-shirt, um, and overcome a very complex supply chain, um, it would really benefit 
um, sustainable growers and, and also a customer base that is growing and really demanding that farmers um, and the fashion industry can reduce and recycle, account for their carbon, be transparent and traceable, and also be here for more than just profit. Um, the social enterprises around um, uh, you know, new trendy denim brands or trendy t-shirt brands, I believe that people are really asking for, for more than just products and, um, and they really do want, um, want to know about farming and know about the people who've made their garments. Um, and in Australia, we have yeah, technology to enable this as well as um, some really impressive stats regarding our environment and um, water use and pesticides. Um, the complex part is, is the supply chain. Um, and that's, um, that is something that, that, um, that many brands are working to overcome um, to highlight, um, yeah, to, to give everybody more opportunities. Um, to align, you know, to align with our, um, you know, with, with common goals. And in fact, one of the questions that's popped up right in the chat, just to start with Tamara, is one for you. Um, as Sonia Kamiski, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation if that's wrong, um, is a question for Tamara. What do you think about how producers can influence consumer demands in a way that lends itself to improved production outcomes, for example, environmental stewardship. Can producers influence consumers? All the traffic seems to be one way traditionally. I think, um, I think in some ways we can. Um, once upon a time, I'm sure we would have all said, oh, you know, get involved on social media, um, start an Instagram page, tell your story. I think we all know it's not that simple anymore. Um, I don't know that individuals can really influence consumers, but, um, but certainly when you think about consumers as, um, of, of say textiles, um, that connection with brands, you know, brands tell consumers what they want. And I think Cotton Australia does a really great job of connecting with brands um, who are then doing the hard work I think it's about influencing the influences. Um, yeah, we can we can certainly be involved um, and and more effective in that way. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, don't be. You know, I think I think there is actually benefit to um, having those micro influences, whether that's on a um, yeah, whether that's on Twitter or or social media of some kind. But um, but I think. Yeah, connecting with the brands and policy makers um, can yeah can be more more effective. Um, and I, I don't know, Jody, we might need to um, seek out Country Road perhaps to kit us out at Nuffield. Um, but they did some really amazing stuff with their um, latest launch around where does your where does your fibre come from and very powerful stuff. So I think that's a really excellent point. Um, a question uh, for either Tom or Alistair. Uh, where does our responsibility, from Elizabeth Wells, where does our responsibility for the welfare of our export sheep or cattle end in terms of their humane treatment and slaughter? Maybe I'll jump to you first, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Emma, and thanks for the question, Elizabeth. I think it's really important to remember being an exporter. Um, our responsibility doesn't, responsibility as producers doesn't finish at our shoreline. I mean, saying that, I acknowledge how challenging it can be, but if we want to uh, have these markets, we need to take responsibility or uh, be part of that supply chain right through to the consumer, whether it be on our shores or others. It can be difficult. And there's some really, there's some cultural and religious um, things in that space that people neg neglect to remember. And I think that some of my travel help that, that further understanding, but we have, it's going to be ongoing ongoing training um, but we do have to work work closely through and certainly can't be ignorant to the fact that if we're sending products overseas we need to follow that product right through to the to the table would you like to add to that um alistair yeah absolutely and great comments there tom and i, I couldn't agree more um, and i think it is because of our responsibility and following it through you know in light of historical events that are really uh focused focused 
uh, us in this area that we are providing and companies that are export oriented, live export oriented, I have vertical integration. I've ever visited a feedlot um, in, in Indonesia and, and I have to say the standard was exceptional. Um, and I guess, you know, there, there has been historically a cry for the stop of live export. Um, that doesn't create a, a, a result or a, uh, an answer to the problem at all. It just means another country would step in with probably far lesser standards than we have. So I think, you know, the, the, the best result that we can have certainly as a country and an industry, which is worth a lot to us, is to continue in the vein we're going. And it's all just about um, just continual improvement in that area. And I think it's, uh, yeah, like Tom said, it just doesn't stop when it leaves the shore. Do you think it's possible that we've um, already lost the battle on live export? I'm just chiming in with my own question. That the public sentiment against it is is very very strong. It seems like uh, where you can turn live exports over, uh, off overnight, that there's always that risk depending on um, who's in government, of course. But do you think that it's too late to win back the the public support and understanding around live export? Uh, so I just jump in there. No, I don't think it is at all. I think what it is is about, um, and I think it's it's the terminology and the language we use around. It's not we need to educate anyone. We need to create, um, you know, information provided that we are uh, at the forefront of animal welfare standards worldwide and have reduced uh, livestock loading densities, you know, um, on our ships and 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 those sorts of examples. And and you know, I guess it is. It's very easy uh, to get wound up in the media coverage. Of it all and not have a full understanding of it and i think that as an industry is something that we need to focus on is to really highlight the positives of the industry and and there is there's, um, there's social media uh, i think the livestock collective is doing a great job and and just you know to name to name but one but um but no i think it's anything but and it's worth uh, far too much of an industry uh, to just uh, sit on our hands and not really advocate how, how well we are doing it absolutely um now a quick was asked and answered in the chat, but I'm going to read it out um, for Gabriella to, to share with the entire audience. Uh, it's a question from Renee Anderson. Um, she said she's noticed that the social human factor was missing from the sustainability goals for the multinationals. Um, Gabriella, would you like to comment on that? Yes, thank you. This was a great opportunity. And there is also a question from Mark that I can tackle both. Uh, the first one that you mentioned, in fact, I didn't mention, thank you for calling this out. We have part of our key goals is climate, environmental protection, and empower 100 million smallholder farmers. This is one big piece for us. Then we have Deloitte account with the accountability. And on top of this, across our corporation, we have goals related to more diversity and taking care of people across our organization and supply chain. Then, yes, good point. It's important to ensure we mentioned this in the beginning. I did not mention. And second point was from Mark, related to how would be the best way to connect. Then my suggestion is really using some campaigns that are out there where we can upload our videos, our best case, and ensure this is there. Uh, final point is there is pathways that are, are being uploaded in each country, how this country will be reaching out a more sustainable agriculture. Then this is another piece important for us to ensure we keep our eyes on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and now, Lachlan, who should be setting the benchmarks and targets for agricultural producers, industry or consumers? I think um it's there's another one in the mix there um and that's investors right in terms of the um the people that fund, uh our collective debt in agriculture um without without factoring in their aspirations um as well as a an industry that's one sustainable from a, a returns perspective but also a a do no harm perspective as well um, that's that's really really important to consider. So I think it's all three, and you see you see um, some of the debates going on at the moment. That so they're trying to counterbalance all of them, um, and we've got that from everywhere, from federal parliament, from um, the certain people um, questioning sort of the role of banks to um, 
there's almost a race in the FMCG companies at the moment about who can be, let's say, seen as the most sustainable um, in terms of what their aspirations are. And this is targeting not only um, consumers in terms of the image that the companies think about to, that drive their products, but also the targeting investors and shareholders as well of those companies. So I, don't, I can't answer the question directly. I don't know exactly where the balance lies. Um, in, in the end, I, I would hope that um, it's also about... Um, it's also about managing a landscape as well. What's what's best for landscape as well? Um, that's absolutely critical in that decision. And I think the real risk is that with um, eighty-seven percent of our population being urban, um, that landscape is probably poorly understood. And if that number continues in that direction, um, as to what um, the, the the other panelists were saying in terms of um, our, how we how we just talk about live export, for example, um, how we talk about ecology, how we talk about carbon, how we talk about whatever it might be, that often needs to be explained on a quite a granular level because people's lived experience in, a, in an urban environment, which is um, the majority of us, um, they, don't, they can't conceptualise it from, from, from their from their lived experience. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. I'm sorry for not answering the question absolutely directly, but I, I really, I think it's a balance between the four. And um, it's one of those things you can probably um, never get a hundred percent right. But um, so long as you're addressing it in good faith, you can, um, you, you can significantly improve. I think I might ask, question to the entire panel starting with yourself Lachlan do you think mm. that farmers in Australia right now have the tools available to them to actually start upon this journey or, or are we just all spouting out a whole bunch of ideology right now um I think there's the the tools that exist um uh, have seen significant improvement over the last let's say three to five years um, and depending on which we jump into on the themes, if you think about what we've got in terms of measurement and understanding of water, um, we're probably definitely there. Um, carbon, we're probably halfway there with, with a lot of work to do in terms of measurement. But biodiversity is probably the big one where we're just sort of scratching the surface at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my perception. Of, of things. Um, animal welfare, I think we're well developed relative to other markets, but I, I'd be really interested to hear from the, the scholars um, where, where they think they are, where, where they think we are relative to where we probably need to be in 30 years time. I think that would be a, um, yeah, that'd be an interesting, an interesting perspective as well. Tom, would you like to um, chime into this one? Like on your farm, do you have the tools available to measure, manage, and what is it that you're measuring and managing? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a really complicated space that uh, certainly is not, we're not the full way there yet. Um, and I, I touched on it previously where animal welfare is still subjective um, and you ask uh, someone in Rundle Mall versus um, someone out here at Tintinara a couple hundred k's away and you ask them to define animal welfare or, or paint a picture of, of what good animal welfare looks like and you're going to get two very different answers. I think in the next 30 years we need to be able to scientifically and objectively measure animal welfare because we can't just ask an animal, how are you feeling? Does this feel good? What does this taste like? So we have to there's a whole power of work getting done at the moment around behaviour. It's, it's, a lot of it's around behaviour, behavior. so relating behaviour to animal welfare. And it's a, it's, it gets quite sciencey, but I think that's where we have to go. Uh, um, but it, we have to remember, I think, the industry's fallen down before preaching science and facts to consumers. It, it, it's been proven not to work as well on the other, other side of that coin. Jake, um, in a cherry um, pack shed, how do you measure your carbon and your emissions and your sequestration? And do you have the tools or do you easily have the tools at hand to be able to uh, measure that for your own farm and business? Uh, essentially, we don't measure. We don't have the tools at hand on our scale at this point. So there's some, some work to be done. And there's a question in here that kind of um, talks to that. 
Uh, Stephen Hobbs has said, what do you see as the role of government and how do we as an industry ensure that we get good sound legislation and not popularity slash vote grabbing legislation? Tamara, why don't you tackle that one? I think, Emma, by the time it's at legislation, we've lost so many little battles along the way. Um, obviously, yeah, engaging with, with policymakers at that high level, but um, you know, I don't think um, I don't think walls are built overnight. You know, it's probably a case of of little steps along the way um, that um, yeah that that also begin with connecting with the customer and just doing the right yeah doing the right thing, being proactive, telling our story. I think if it's um, you know if it's already landed on um, you know if it, if it's landed at a point where there's a um, a big stick about to be used, then um, you know we've sort of lost that lost that battle. Um, but um, I, I think yeah, we can all think of several examples of that. If um, yeah, if if live export was to be used, you know it it wasn't um, it was a knee jerk you know reaction to to pull that trade, but um, but that probably wasn't the first time you know that was an issue or um, in the media, I think, yeah, small steps and just keeping um, keeping telling that positive story and um, yeah, keeping in contact, um, yeah, with what community wants. Uh, Gabriella, one for you. In terms of the farming landscape going forward, do you see larger corporates purging smaller farmers out continually? Or will technology reverse this trend, allowing small farmer holdings to start building instead of declining around the world and contribute to improving the performance and sustainability of agriculture? Very good question. By the way, all the questions are really, we can see the scholars here, right? Uh, yes, I believe it's crucial to make sure the smallholders will be able to step up in a different way but this is something that we need to work. We, we have been working very hard. We have the lights also following out the numbers because this is not a, a given, right? It's not easy. There is request for capacity building. We need to ensure women are being prepared also. Then uh, there is a lot. You cannot just deploy the technology. You need to ensure the community is getting it. Women are getting it and are being prepared. Then. Uh, I believe I'm very optimistic because we are working to make it happen, but it requires a lot of work. Yes, good question. Thank you. It's a great question. And to follow on from that, Nigel uh, Corish has actually said, should the responsibility be the same for small producers versus the big corporate producers when it comes to sustainability? Yes, uh, of course, it's big corporations like Bayer. We need to ensure our report of sustainability is connected to financial report. Something that you mentioned, you Emma mentioned in the beginning, and we are very proud. We, we are among the few companies that have the board of management receiving part of the compensation related to sustainability goals. And this is also different than uh, small holders or than small companies, let's say. Then that being said, I really believe there are different responsibilities. Yes, and we are up to this. Thank you. Alistair, I'd like your perspective on that question as well. Do you think uh, small farmers and large corporates have different responsibilities and where do you draw the line? What's a small farm versus, you know, a corporate farm or, uh, you know, multinational? How would you divide that up? Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, again, great question, but it, it, I guess it just relates back to, uh, you know, an industry and the standards you set um, in terms of the, the policies that are made uh, within the advocacy groups and, you know, and, and I guess what's funding that is, you know, we talk about levies being put on, uh, transaction levies on cattle, you know, and, and obviously a person who is, um, you know, you're still all bound by the same rules, but the person who is, uh, has a much uh, smaller production is paying a lot less of the transaction levy. But so I guess there's more for the uh, big companies at stake in terms of what they're investing in it. But the small companies as well. So it's up to the, the industry and the, and the industry bodies to, to regulate that. But there absolutely is no room for complacency or substandard behaviour at any level. Um, and I guess that's up to the industry level. 
well, industry bodies to uphold. And, and hopefully that's where those transaction levies are being put forward to ensure that that's There's that moment where you wonder whether it's your internet or somebody else's and you look around the screen to see the facial expressions and I'm pretty sure it's somebody else's, which is good news for me. I might just jump to the next question, but Alistair, if you get back into your Zoom speed, um, this one's a question for you also, but also to the whole panel. Emma Leonard has asked, you all had a focus on customers in relation to your study. What portion of the price do you think that consumers are prepared to pay for ever increasing demands for sustainability, animal welfare, and, and et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. Is it just going to become part of the part of the price or are we gonna be able to keep adding a premium for these sustainability considerations? Um, I might go straight to you, Tom. Uh, thanks, Emma, and another uh, good question. I think uh, MLA um, has some great data on this around consumer. Um, and what, what the consumers uh, really look at. And price, funnily enough, is, is still still right up there and, and will continue to be given uh, economics and, and wider, wider things. Other ones like health, quality, taste, um, and then the animal welfare concerns are there as well. But price is really key. My probably take home from what I saw and what I'd like to see is consumers have a choice. Um, and that's just the choice to eat meat in general or the choice to eat uh, products that align with their values. And I think that's really important. And, and if they, they can afford it and they choose to eat uh, those products that align with their values, that's a, that's a great result for everyone. Again, we're, we're an exporter to a huge amount of nations with all different, we need to set a minimum standard, but we have a lot of customers with a lot of different expectations. So it's, it's quite a complicated space. I'm going to add to that from my own Nuffield experience. Do you think the danger in that approach is that potentially um, it's the rich people who get food with the highest uh, nutrition or the, the best standards? Or are we, do we then create an even further divide um, amongst the consumers who maybe, you know, some consumers can't afford to buy free range sustainable eggs. Um, some people want to buy different eggs or they you know, from an animal welfare consideration, perhaps they want to buy caged eggs because it's at a price point. Do you think that it's difficult then when we're using price as the um, maybe the, the carrot or the stick for the consumer? Uh, if, that's, if that's back to me, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's important to know that we are all um, continually improving and going in the right direction. It's really important. There's a minimum standard that we meet and continually work on. I still think there's room there. I'd probably challenge... Um, a statement to say that there, there is a certain level, but animal welfare has, doesn't have a strong relation to nutritional value. Um, so I do do challenge that, and I do think um, visiting other continents uh, that aren't as advanced in their in their economics as, as a, such as Australia, um, caged eggs versus free range is the last thing they're worrying about at this stage. But it's still really important uh, to go on that journey and bring bring all through for the ride. Great point. Uh, I remember being in a chicken farm in India and it was a, a very wide awakening when, you know, you spend the morning at the chicken farm and then in the afternoon you go and see a slum and you see how the people are living and, and the when you start thinking about animal welfare and the cultural considerations and all of those things that you've pointed out. But what I love in Nuffield is when the um, panellists themselves start uh, maybe disagreeing with each other. So Tamara has said, should we really, Tamara on the panel has put a question in the chat, should we really be paid extra for, ju for just doing the right thing? So Tamara, do you want to explain your rhetorical question? Something that, um, that people always ask is, you know, who is going to pay for this? And if I was to relate this to say our own farm, um, you know, if we're trying, if we're um, engaging in best management practice and, um, genuinely sustainable for our own you know our own values um should we really be asking a customer to pay us extra or should we just be doing the right thing you know um yes there are probably added costs in terms of a transparent supply chain and i can see that 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 might be something we need to pass on to the customer but um if it's just um looking after the environment and being a um, responsible steward um i think yeah, it's not up to us to ask for extra. I think, um, you know, we need to, uh, to take a bit of that responsibility ourselves. 
I'll ask the brave question. Does anybody on the panel have a different perspective on that? What you know I, say? I, I, I'll play devil's advocate just to um, just just to do it. I had a really interesting conversation with a few sugar producers um, up on the reef, and um, what one of the I was horribly sceptical to begin with about um, the the passive income market of reef credits and to mm -hmm. to Tamara's point, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, if it's if it's just the right thing, um, why why shouldn't you do it? And I think. The, the issue that we come across in, in certain agricultural types is that when we have a, um, when we have basically the need for a commodity pr produced and even at best practice efficiency with current technology, um, there is still um, harm to something downstream mm -hmm. or upstream of the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then if the market's not willing to pay for that because it's a, it's a staple, mm -hmm can be essentially the production of that can be off sh offshored in a market that doesn't care about it, who actually picks up the bill, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is this is something that um, we'll see evolve over the next 10 or 15 years, as that is those, let's say those um, um, credit markets or passive income markets for farmers where um, the last mile of um, mm -hmm. basically getting to a zero harm situation is is really, really hard to achieve. Absolutely. And Emma Leonard has um, put back into the chat, I'm not asking them to pay extra. I'm asking what part of price covers social responsibilities versus pure production costs? I think it purely depends on the commodity and the market. It's... I was going to say, as a national scholar myself, I'd love to answer that question. <laughs> it's, it, it's fascinating, but I, I guess that the social responsibilities are just simply part of the production cost as we, as we start to see things being not necessarily imposed, but even the things that we adopt ourselves as they come at a higher price, it'll be part of the cost of production. Did you want to add to that, Tamara? Because you've been humming and agreeing madly yes. in the background there. Yeah. I um no I, I agree with you Emma that yeah it is just um part of our cost of production to um to look after the community and um yeah serve our social responsibility to you know to our best capacity but I agree also that every um industry has different um impositions and um for for various reasons yeah we it's hard to compare apples and apples yeah. Yeah, great point. Um, and maybe I'll throw this question to Jake. With sustainability and provenance as an increasing issue in ag supply chains, where do the panellists, but um, specifically to you, Jake, um, see new sensing and measurement technologies going into in the future? The biggest thing for me and for us, I guess, is improving shelf life of fruit. All fruit and vegetable has a fairly limited shelf life. So we're trying to use data and sensors, technology to try and improve the shelf life of, in this case, cherries, to reduce that waste, reduce food waste at the consumer at the, and the retailer level. Thank you. Um, it's we, That last chat that we got ourselves involved in has, has raised a, a few more issues. The quick, and it was a question to me because I couldn't help myself, but it's why is, oops, my thing just jumped. Why is carbon and animal welfare not part of the cost of production? But I think it is. Do you have... What considerations are you making or thinking about in your business, Jake, around that kind of, I guess, corporate social responsibility and, and sustainability? What things are glaringly obvious in your business? Um, in terms of social responsibility, I guess our industry differs a bit to some of the other panellists today. So the biggest issue is uh, labour, the cost of labour and peace rates for us, especially, which has become especially prevalent in the last two years, which was kind of unexpected. Um, yeah, it, it, it ties in a bit with what we were talking before. So there's a bit of a misconception, I guess, around what a harvest worker gets paid or can get paid based, by, based on some poor experiences in the past. There seems to be a difference in what consumers say online that they will pay extra for, they'll pay a certain amount extra for workers to be paid more. There's a difference in that between what they actually do pay with their wallets at the end of the day. So. Yeah, we're in the same situation, whereas where does the responsibility lie? And currently in our systems, it, it tends to fall back to the dollar. So 
anything we do to pay more is going to make our product cost more in the end. It, it very rarely gets passed on to us, especially with what I'm doing. You know, I'm I'm a pre premium product. People don't need cherries; they buy cherries because they want them. So, it, it's a really difficult situation at the moment. Do you think that that gives you more capacity to add um, add to the price then? Given that it's a you know a luxury product, it's it's not seen so much as a commodity line, if you will. Does that give you guys the capacity to charge that bit more for labour? Uh, yeah, it do, it does give us the capacity to charge a bit more for the end product. Uh, it seems to work better in Asia, in some of the export markets that we're going there. The Australian consumer uh, seems to vote more on purely price, which I understand. I'm a consumer for ninety nine percent of products myself. So at the end of the day, if, if a certain product is more expensive, then we'll, we'll just choose something else. Yeah. And what a great, I mean, great observation. I guess the problem then is, is are we going to leave it to regulation? Because to the point that you made about piece rate, you know, it's currently sitting before the Fair Work Commission and whether or not there should be a floor put in piece rate. If it's, if the consumers are not going to be willing to pay, um, of, you know, voluntarily more, and it's difficult to demonstrate those things. And I, I'm really happy that you brought up ethical, you know, the ethical kind of side of the, the humans that are part of agriculture. Um, and it has been mentioned in the chat, actually, because we talk about sustainable development goals, and maybe, you know, we're talking about consumption and production, but it's very much a part of it, like the humans that are part of it. Um, so does that mean that we're going to leave it to regulation then? Does, it, does the government have to come and regulate what the, you know, what labour should be worth? And I mean, it does very much so in this country. If we don't have the capacity to tell our story and, and charge for those extras in inverted commas, although I know that's vexed, um, you know, does that leave it to regulation or is there still room for that storytelling? I think there's room for storytelling and lobbying, but I think at the end of the day, it will come down to regulation and whether we like it or not, a lot of the um, policies that get made in this country are based on popular opinion and whatever the vibe is at the time, and that's likely to continue. So um, we sort of just have to work with that. So that was one of the main points of my Nuffield study, that this is going to happen. Cost of production is going to go up. Uh, my main focus on trying to improve shelf life is improve the amount of fruit that makes it to the consumer. Uh, improve the quality of our fruit so we're getting our fruit into more niche markets around the world that will pay that are willing to match that premium thank you um now gabriella uh, has to shoot off i mean we all do very shortly but um thank you so much for your input gabriella um if anybody has ex extra questions just shoot them through to nuffield and we can hook you up so that you can get more out of um the wonderful insights gabriella has been able to provide us with today so thank you so much Obrigado, and uh, what is it? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Great job and awesome team. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's just jump straight into a Nuffield Scholar question, of, which is not a question at all, but a statement, unsurprising from Nicola Ann Mann, 2014 Scholar. She said, good points, Tamara, but we're all guests on this earth and everyone needs to take responsibility for our resources, including consumers. Plot price reflects value and therefore must be value, oh, sorry, and there must be value associated with treating the world right. If items are cheap, consumers don't respect the, the resources, et cetera, used to produce it and can become wasteful. And I think with um, Tamara, it'd be great for you to chime in here, and I know you did on the chat, to answer to everybody, because we see fast fashion. Uh, you know, you can go and get yourself a $12 top in, in Kmart and it does create this like, you know, every season I can get five new things because it's not very expensive. Did you want to um, share your commentary with the rest of the viewers? Yes. Um, no, I, I apologise for my dog barking in the background. <laughs> no, that um, that's case in point. Um, fast fashion comes from a lack of care for the garment. And if your T-shirt's only $3 and you'd like three different colours, then then chances are you might throw away two of those because you haven't, you know, you don't, you don't value it. Um, in terms of cotton, cotton is much more expensive than polyester. So it is naturally, it's, yeah, our biggest competition isn't other natural fibres. It's, it's cheap polyester that is always, um, always a consistent price and, um, you know, isn't, um, isn't subject to the weather and, um, and production risk. 
so I, I think, yeah, um, fast fashion and textile waste, um, it's really coming into consciousness. And I think really, yeah, proves the point that if something is too cheap, people won't value it. Um, so even though cotton is more expensive, it's actually one of our advantages is that um, it is more expensive. So it will be more valued um, and people will be less likely to, um, to discard a, um, a garment without, you know, fully um, valuing it. Mm. Righto, and we're, we've got one minute to go. So I'm going to get all the Nuffield scholars on the panel just to answer this question succinctly, please. If, and it's from Luke, uh, if, if sustainable producers are getting premiums, won't others look over the fence and possibly follow suit? In the world of branding, it seems products are getting sold on much less merit. A line from you, starting with Tamara. Um, well, wouldn't that be a good thing if everybody looks over the fence and says, oh, look, there's a little price premium here. I might lift my game and become more sustainable, whatever that, you know, whatever that means. Um, I don't think that could be a bad thing. Uh, Jake, what's your chime in? Uh, yeah, I guess that could be, that could be happening, uh, whether it's sustainable or whether we just grow and burst bubbles for various different issues as we go. I'm not sure. Tom? Yeah, thanks. And again, to Lachlan's point earlier, every every market and every product is very different. Uh, and, and raising claims in the beef industry is um, hu a huge thing. But I do think um, there just is going to be that general leapfrogging and one-upping. And, and it's going to be good for all, I think, as long as we're doing it in a sustainable manner that, that the producers can continue to uh, achieve and, and, and truly have that triple bottom line. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Look, right, I think as an export oriented um, ag industry, regardless of what it is, you know, profitability is a premium and profitability that is injected back into any industry will create better research and development and hopefully adoption and, and hopefully all combined to create a more sustainable industry. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, panel scholars. Um, Tamara, you made you were just saying that a, a rising tide uh, lifts all boats, or whatever the eloquent expression is. Um, when I did my CSC, CSC uh, someone from Rabobank came and did a presentation, and actually the line was, "Everything becomes commoditized in the end," and that was something that was very, very interesting. To me. Um, so, thank you very much for the panelists for their participation. Um, really, really appreciate that. We didn't get to all the questions in the chat, uh, could have gone on all day. Um, and if any audience members would like to speak directly to any of the panellists, please just let Nuffield know and we'll pass out the details of the scholars. Now I'll hand over to Jody Redcliffe, the CEO of Nuffield and 2013 scholar, um, who's going to let us know some info regarding the newly selected 2022 scholars who were announced this morning. And thank you so much for the opportunity to um, provide my pound of flesh back to Nuffield that I was, uh, it was promised to me that I would have to, um, and having me as your host for the panel today. Thank you very much, Emma. As usual, an excellent job of facilitating our Nuffield conversation, which goes in lots of different directions. So my name is Jodie Redcliffe. I'm a 2013 Nuffield Scholar. I'm CEO of Nuffield Australia and of Nuffield International. I'm very excited to announce six of our new scholars just now and then more tomorrow. So we will start off in alphabetical order. Omid Ansari is a Queenslander. He's from Virginia and he's studying how agronomy practices and purpose-built machinery and technologies can help Australian hemp growers. He's very generously supported by the Sylvia and Charles Vertel Charitable Foundation. Our next scholar is Jasmine Boxall. Jasmine is also from Queensland, from Biara, near Tugulawa. Jasmine is supported by the Meat and Livestock Australia and will be studying challenges and opportunities for carbon reduction and sequestration in Australia's northern pastoral industry. And next we have another Queenslander. We are going in alphabetical order, though. We have Luke Chaplin from Cloncurry in Queensland. Luke will be studying commercial models of UAVs to emulate traditional helicopter mustering in a more cost-effective and efficient way. He's generously supported by PSP Investments. Jessica Conlon is from Elmore in Victoria. 
Jessica is a fat lamb producer and is studying methods to grow more and better quality pasture for lambs in a grass-fed finishing system. She's supported by the William Buckland Foundation. Max Edgeley is a Tasmanian scholar from Kingston. He's studying the opportunities for medicinal cannabis producers in Australia. He's generously supported by the J.M. Roberts Charitable, Charitable Trust, I beg your pardon, and the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture. And finally for today, another Tasmanian scholar, Colette Glazik, is from Ross. Colette is studying fairer ways to audit greenhouse gas emissions for wool production in Australia. Colette is supported by the Australian Wool Innovation Limited or AWI. We welcome these six of our new 2022 scholars and we look forward to following their journeys for supporting them as the Nuffield alumni and investors and the wider community so that we can all benefit from the learnings of their research. Now I'll hand over to our facilitator for the second session, which is Dave Brownhill. <laughs>